In November of 1620, a hundred pilgrims arrived on Mashpee Wampanoag land in the town of Patuxet, later renamed Plymouth. A year later, there was a feast shared by the Wampanoag and the English pilgrims, and a myth was created about the first Thanksgiving. As a country, we have been celebrating this myth ever since. But I know the Wampanoag. I was the archivist for the Mashpee Wampanoag, a tribe that has had to fight for centuries to hold on to its culture, its history, and its land in the face of endless treachery. I've learned from Wampanoag, Pequot, and Narragansett elders in New England, and they have told me what really happened at that first Thanksgiving and in the years before and after that day. They have impressed upon me the importance of telling the truth because lies have caused so much harm to indigenous people over the years. The truth is that a few years before the pilgrims arrived, disease arrived from Europeans and wiped out 70 to 90% of the indigenous population in New England. European diseases like smallpox, bubonic plague, cholera, malaria, measles, scarlet fever, yellow fever, and sexually transmitted diseases like syphilis were introduced to the land by conquistadors, English traders, and slave traders. And these diseases killed so many people that towns like Paxtucket were left vacant and filled with graves when the colonists arrived in the 1600s. But this horrible human devastation was described as divine providence and a blessing by the colonists. King James, in an effort to justify his desire to usurp this land from the indigenous, would describe the devastation as, quote, by God's visitation, a wonderful plague. Ramona Peters is an artist, tribal elder, traditionalist, and the director of the Cultural Preservation Department for the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe. I first met her 20 years ago when I was working on a film called Who Owns the Past? about the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act of 1990, a law that requires the bones and ancestral remains of Native Americans to be returned to the tribes they belong to. She taught me the true history of Thanksgiving. Years later, I would befriend Tall Oak Whedon, an artist, activist, and historian of Mashantucket, Pequot, and Wampanoag descent. He taught me the history of Indian white relations in New England, a topic he gave many speeches on during his eight decades on this planet. In her many interviews about the first Thanksgiving, Ramona Peters has tried to set the record straight. In one account, she explains, quote, you've probably heard the story of how Squanto assisted in the pilgrims planting of corn. So this was their first successful harvest and they were celebrating that harvest and planning a day of their own Thanksgiving. And it's kind of like what some of the Arab nations do when they celebrate by shooting guns in the air. So this is what was going on over there at Plymouth. They were shooting guns and cannons as a celebration, which alerted us because we didn't know who they were shooting at. So Massasoit, the sachem of the Wampanoag, gathered up some 90 warriors and showed up at Plymouth prepared to engage, unquote. Because of the history of kidnapping and enslavement of members of her tribe, they were worried that their people were being taken once again. So they came to investigate. She explains they didn't know it. They didn't know what was happening. It was a fact-finding mission. When they arrived, it was explained through a translator that they were celebrating the harvest. So we decided to stay and make sure that was true because we'd seen what happened in the other landings. So we wanted to make sure. So we decided to camp nearby for a few days. During those few days, the men went out to hunt and gather food, deer, ducks, geese, and fish. There are 90 men here. And at the time, I think there were only 23 survivors of that boat, the Mayflower. She went on to explain that the pilgrims were always vulnerable to the new land, new creatures, even the trees. So they were very vulnerable and we did protect them, not just support them, we protected them. You can see throughout their journals that they were always nervous. And unfortunately, when they were nervous, they were very aggressive, unquote. 
Ramona also taught me about the grave robbing the early pilgrims engaged in that first winter. They unearthed dead bodies, retrieved the trinkets and corn and beans buried with them and left the bodies dispersed above ground. Before the pilgrims, the conquistadors of Spain had been the first grave robbers. After the pilgrims, grave robbing of native graves became a national pastime. So that over time, estimates have been made that between 70 and 90 percent of all Native American graves have been looted in the United States. My friend Tall Oak ded dedicated his life to the education and advocacy of Indigenous rights. And he was a founding member of the National Day of Mourning in Plymouth, Massachusetts. He taught me the truth about Squanto that he only spoke English because he had been kidnapped and enslaved by earlier European visitors. When I lived and worked in New England, Tall Oak used to take me around to all the important places in Rhode Island and Massachusetts and teach me the history of those places. He taught me about the Pequot massacre that happened less than 20 years after the famous Plymouth feast. He described how colonists targeted women and children while they slept setting fire to their dwellings and then shooting anyone who tried to escape the flames. Over 600 Pequot, mostly women and children, were killed in one night. After massacring them, many more were captured and sold into slavery in the Caribbean. The indigenous people's history recounts what happened in the following way. Quote, Pequots were living in two forts. In one fort were mainly Pequot men. In the other were primarily women, children, and elders. John Mason targeted the latter. Slaughter ensued. After killing most of the Pequot defenders, the soldiers set fire to the structures and burned the remaining people there alive. They go on to explain that during the Pequot War, colonists explicitly named the procurement of captives or slaves as one of their goals. Soldiers sent groups of captured Pequot to Boston and other cities for distribution while claiming particular captured people as their own. Tall Oak also taught me about King Philip's war and took me to King Philip's seat. He taught me the importance of honoring the history and the land, of telling the stories. He decried the many lies told about the history of Indian white relations in New England. He taught me that if we do not tell the truth about what happened, we will never be able to heal. King Philip's War, in which the Wampanoag Confederacy attempted to help the Narragansett tribes hold onto their land, was marked by the Great Swamp Massacre, in which 20% of the Narragansett population was killed and many more were sold into slavery. In 1880, the Rhode Island legislature, despite the plenary authority of Congress over Indian affairs, stripped the Narragansett of tribal status forced the sale of tribal lands mm -hmm. and otherwise dissolved their rights as an independent people. For about a hundred years, the tribe was illegally erased and disempowered under state law. In 1978, in order to take their land away, a federal jury declared that the Mashpee Wampanoag were not a tribe. The decision was eventually reversed and the Mashpee were federally recognized, but not until 2007. In 2020, the Department of the Interior under Trump took the Mashpee land out of trust in yet another attempt to delegitimize them. Everybody knows this is the tribe who saved the pilgrims from starving that first winter. But for centuries, the tribe has been deprived of land recognition and acknowledgement. This is what happens when you don't tell the whole truth. When I lived in Rhode Island, I ran an educational program for the Rhode Island Indian Council. I witnessed firsthand the effects of this long history on Narragansett, Pequot, and Wampanoag urban Indians, many of whom lived in poverty and suffered from low self-esteem because of the loss of land and the ongoing racism they experienced. Paulo gave me teaching materials, which I share with my students in an effort to teach them the truth about their past so they could be proud. While running the GED program, I encountered modern day racism manifested in efforts by state officials to prevent my students from succeeding by grading their tests under a different rubric 
just because they were Indian. I had to file complaints at a high level in the state to the Board of Education, and I had to allow one of my teachers to drive my students to a nearby white testing center in order to ensure that they would have their tests graded fairly. The problem is not solely one of history. The lies that have been told continue to result in modern day oppression. In the 1820s and 1830s, a Pequot and Wampanoag minister named William Appis tried to address the lies being told about Thanksgiving. He argued, quote, that the nation needed to rethink the colonization of New England and view it through indigenous perspectives. Appis was the grandson of Sachem Medicom, a.k.a. King Philip. And according to historian Peter Mankaw, he was a leader in the Massachusetts indigenous people's battle to preserve their lands and to take greater control over their communities in an uprising known as the Mashpee Revolt of 1833 to 1834. Paul Oak told me that it was Apis's activism in writings that inspired him to organize the first National Day of Mourning to commemorate the true story of the first Thanksgiving. In 1970, Wamsuta, also known as Frank James, an Aquina Wampanoag man, was invited to address the 350th anniversary of the first Thanksgiving in Plymouth, Massachusetts. But the speech he wrote was rejected by the organizers for being too radical or perhaps too truthful. The speech was deemed, quote, inappropriate and inflammatory, unquote, and James was given a revised speech. He refused to read it and was subsequently uninvited from the program. An excerpt from that famous speech reads as follows, quote, it is with mixed emotion that I stand here to share my thoughts this is a time of celebration for you, celebrating an anniversary of a beginning for the white man in America, a time of looking back, of reflection. It is with a heavy heart that I look back upon what happened to my people. Even before the pilgrims landed, it was common practice for explorers to capture Indians, take them to Europe, and sell them as slaves for 220 shillings apiece. The pilgrims had hardly explored the shores of Cape Cod for four days before they had robbed the graves of my ancestors and stolen their corn and beans. Mort's relation describes a searching party of 16 men. Mort goes on to say that the party took as much of the Indians' winter provisions as they were able to carry. When Tsutu's speech was the first public critique of Thanksgiving by an indigenous American, Hearing of Wemsuta's mistreatment, Talok gathered several other indigenous activists from the region, including Frank James, to hold the first national day of mourning in Plymouth Harbor. He gave his speech to the crowd gathered there, and this event has been held every year since. The purpose of the national day of mourning is to, quote, educate the public about Native Americans in the United States, notably the Wampanoag, and other tribes of the Eastern United States, dispel myths surrounding the Thanksgiving story of the United States, and raise awareness toward historical and ongoing struggles facing Native American tribes. Today, many Native, American, Native Americans celebrate a national day of mourning on Thanksgiving Day, while some tribes, like the Mashpee, celebrate a more traditional Thanksgiving. Mashpee elder Ramona Peters explains, quote, in Wampanoag culture, we have four major Thanksgiving ceremonies for each season every year and several smaller Thanksgivings together for greeting such things as strawberries, green corn, and swanning fish. Nothing in our ancestors' world was taken for granted, unquote. She explained that they don't just give thanks once a year. She explains that while for Americans, there is often a Christian element to Thanksgiving with formal prayer and families going around the table discussing what each person is thankful for, in Mashpee families, we make offerings of tobacco. For traditionalists, we give thanks to our first mother, our human mother, and to Mother Earth. I am pleased to see that land acknowledgements are now commonplace in some regions. The truth that Thanksgiving 
the truth about Thanksgiving is now easy to find and read about online. This was not true even 20 years ago when I met Ramona. Nor was it the case 13 years ago when I met Tall Oak. I hope that 10 years from now, every Thanksgiving celebration will come with an acknowledgement of what really happened. As Tall Oak taught me, it is only by remembering and acknowledging our past that we can hope to heal the present. Shona Bache, thank you for listening to my words. <laughs>